Well, good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar. And what I'd like to do is just take you on a quick uh, show through uh, one of the labs that I'm doing in physics today. And this is a really fundamental lab. And, and what we've been talking about in the last class is kind of an introduction to uh, quantum mechanics, uh, a little bit about how uh, we had to make transition from classical mechanics and Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's equations and and all this and that, and, and the re really the reason that we had to make that transition was there were um, lots of phenomena that, that we were that we were looking at at the turn of the century: uh, black body radiation, the ultraviolet catastrophe, um, the photoelectric effect, and so on and so forth. And, and we realized that the classical models that we had that were based primarily on Newton's laws of motion. But weren't able to explain these these fundamental uh, questions, and they they weren't able to explain uh, the structure of an atom. And so we went through uh, a little bit about um, the history, um, starting at uh, um, Max Planck and how he kind of used his uh, uh, this this theory of um, not not necessarily theory, but a thought that that maybe um, energy of of light in a black body might be quantized. Um, he didn't call it that, but um, that's kind of where it started all the way to uh, the mid-1920s when uh, the Schrodinger equation came out. And the Schrodinger equation is really weird because it treated um, electrons, which are commonly thought of as particles, it treated electrons as, as kind of like waves and that they were uh, standing waves that were more or less um, confined within a certain space, a certain energy level. And this is very non-intuitive to, to my students, and clearly it's non-intuitive to me, and it's non-intuitive to pretty much everybody who tries to really think about uh, what's going on here. But um, what what I do in this lab is I say, look, I understand that this is really non-intuitive, but let's do an experiment that actually that uh, an experiment that can prove that the um, the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, as weird as some of them may seem, actually do make testable, verifiable predictions, and this is just a great exercise to do that. And so, so what I do is I say, hey, if atoms, if, if electrons in atoms are quantized, that means that they can only exist in certain levels of energy, and we know that electrons could absorb energy and move up to uh, higher levels of energy, and they can emit energy and move down to lower levels of energy. And when they absorb, they absorb a, a certain uh, photon of light that has a certain energy, and then they and then when they go from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, they release that in the form of light. So it, it stands to reason that if I were to take a certain atom and I were to excite its electrons to high, higher energy levels, as those electrons fall down to lower energy levels, those electrons should only um, release very discrete, very certain amounts of light or types of light, inner energy levels of light. Okay, not just like the the, the white light uh, that that we're used to seeing, but that the atoms themselves, the electrons themselves, can only release very discrete amounts or uh, types of light with with a certain energy associated with it. And so what I do in the lab is I, I actually um, calculate uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation, particularly the binding energy, because the formulas aren't, aren't particularly hard. It's just a, basically the Rydberg constant, uh, just a bunch of constants, and you do some simple division. Um, so the hydrogen atom is a really easy uh, one to do the calculations on. It's not very hard. And I can calculate the, the energy levels of, in, of the ground state of, of, of a hydrogen atom all the way up to whatever I want. And then I go through an exercise and I go, well, let's suppose that I am able to excite um, these electrons, these higher energy levels, and then suppose that they fall down, and let's just see what the, the Schrodinger equation predicts. You know, what is the difference between, say, n equals 6 to n equals 2? And we calculate that difference, and then from what we've done in class, you know, that energy, um, we can, um, through dimensional analysis, turn that energy into a wavelength of light. And say, okay, this is a wavelength. Um, what kind of light should we see? And what we end up predicting, we predict, we predict very um, four, particularly is what we'll do today, four very discrete um, types of light, energy levels of light. Um, 
starting at the blue, or uh, excuse me, starting at the red, more toward the 700 uh, nanometers and, and all the way up to the blue. Um, and then I go, uh, okay, so this is what it predicts, right? Everybody agree that these are what the equations predict. Now let's prove it. Let's do an experiment. And this is the experiment that we do. Um, so I'm going to move the camera over here. So what I do is I have this here. This is, um, this is just a way of putting an electrical potential. I have a cathode and anode. And I put a very, very um, strong electrical potential. I have lots of electrons on one end and not so many on the other end. And that um, is a way of uh, putting a potential across a tube. And in this tube, uh, this is sealed airtight, and I have hydrogen gas inside of this tube. So what I do is I just put this tube in this, what's called the discharge lamp, like so. And then I can turn that discharge lamp on, it'll put a potential across this, okay, electrical potential, a lot of energy, and it will excite the electrons in that hydrogen to higher energy levels, and then those electrons will fall down to lower energy levels and they'll release light. Well, the light that they release is a combination of all the different wavelengths, um, you know, the, all the different visible wavelengths. But wouldn't it be cool if there's a way we could break those into individual wavelengths and take a look and see if, in fact, those individual wavelengths uh, show up? And, in fact, there is. Um, I can use this device, which I'll show you guys here in a little bit. Um, I can also use something even simpler, just something called a diffraction grating, and this is a, just a cheap old pair of what are called um, rainbow glasses, and they, they act much like a prism, and they break light up into its uh, representative colors. So let's go ahead, and I'm just going to move the camera a little closer now. Um, it's not quite centered. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and turn the hydrogen lamp on, Put a potential across it, so now you can see that I have a significant uh, have a, a light coming out. Um, a combination of different colors, but let's see if we can now we'll turn the lights down, break those colors up a little bit. I'm going to put these sunshine or these rainbow glasses over, and hopefully you can see that I have some very distinct colors that are coming out. I have some reds and what appear to be some blues. Um, maybe not so much on, on the recording here. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So maybe there's some credence to this whole Schrodinger wave particle business. But boy, I would really like to see that um, maybe in a little more detail, actually see discrete lines of, of, of light. And that's where this comes in place. This is what's called a spectrometer. And a spectrometer just takes the light, the light comes in through here, it goes through a prism, it gets broken up um, into its various wavelengths of light and you can see here. I have a little window here that allows light to come in and there's a little um, meter um, that actually gives you, a, it's illuminated from um, ambient light. Uh, ambient light comes in through here, illuminates a little meter and it actually tells you the wavelength of the light coming in. Um, and that allows you to make really good predictions. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this back a little bit here and I am going to get this uh, spectrometer set up reasonably well so we can actually see something. Okay, so you should be able, hopefully be able to see two fairly distinct lines, a line uh, between the six and seven hundred nanometers and another line between the 4 and 500, a little closer to the 500, a red and a, a distinct blue line. Let's see if we can see that. Uh, this is going to be kind of an interesting exercise here. So I'm going to move in and I'm going to try to focus this. I don't know if this is going to show up on the camera very well, but there's a very distinct red line and a very distinct uh, blue line. Now there are all kinds of colors because I am, you know, getting some, some pollution and, you know, impurities and whatnot coming through. Um, but hopefully you can make out a really distinct blue and a really distinct red line. I don't know so much with the camera. It actually looks really, really cool in real life. Um, so that's called a spectroscopy. And the interesting thing about this is every element emits light at a different spectrum because the electrons in every single element are, are very different um, levels of energy. 
So what we can do is we can take other elements. I just happen to have a neon here. We can take neon, sodium, lithium, what have you. And we can do the same thing with those elements. And we can look at them and we can identify what those elements are just based on their spectrum. And this is also true with uh, things like stars. We can look at stars at night, break that light up, see what the emission spectrum is of that light and say, okay, I know that this element must be in this sun or even planets to, 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 to some extent. Um, so this is actually very helpful when it comes to making sense of the skies and even making sense of materials. You know, we don't know what a substance is and we can do spectroscopy on it and find out, okay, it contains a lot of this and a lot of that and, and kind of figure out what the, the substance is that we're dealing with. Um, and certainly in respiratory therapy, when we talk about absorption and emission of light um, that this concept is important because we have different instruments that measure things like pulse oximetry, for example, measures how um, atoms absorb light. And it kind of goes without saying that if atoms emit light at certain um, energies, then they probably absorb light at certain energies as well, and that is certainly the case. So you have both emission and absorption spectra. So anyway, I just wanted to show you guys that little exercise. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, thanks for hanging in there.